This episode of Nuff Said is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. Recording has started. Hello and welcome once again to Super Connectivity. I'm your host, Charlie the Professor Esser. And with me as always is the blue-eyed bomber from the Burg of Pits. Phil, fill me in parrot. Hey, Philippe, welcome in beckons. Oh, welcome to this week. So, let's talk about the new show that just showed up where we are forced to question reality, not know what our relationships are, see things that seem to be not real in front of us, and have to analyze that for what the larger story is going to become. Of course, I'm talking about Trickster on the CW. Uh, Philip, have you seen Trickster yet? No, I haven't. Uh, haven't Okay, so that's a 9 o'clock show. On the CW. It is a Canadian import. So right there you know it's Degrassi level good. Um, I gotta say I really like this show. It is... um, It's a show about basically... So here's the basic premise. Our protagonist, a young man... um, has Has a mom who seems to be... Somewhat schizophrenic? Hmm. Yes, that show. And, um... Although it's... They ease into... This is what's neat about it. They ease into... Which is so typical of mental illness. If you've ever spent time with the mentally ill in social settings, you know that there is this moment where... On one level, you just think of them as, oh, yeah, you're just a fun party person. And then you're like, oh, no, that's mania. And um, to the framing device at the start of this is this woman is seeing this man taking her baby. She says, you can't take my baby, yada, yada, yada. The person is walking away. Then she does this, like, kind of primal scream thing. The guy's eyes bleed black. And then we jump ahead in time. Hmm. And we see the young man. So, spoilers for the first episode. We see the young man is now grown. The, The baby is now a young man. His mom is partying and having a wild time with others. And we also see that the young man is actually sort of selling Molly out of the, because he has a job at, at a at a chicken shack, and people say, you know, hey, I want the extra salty fries. And so they pay him for the order. He pockets the excess of the order and drops Molly into the bag. That's the, that's the premise. And uh, we see that this, this drug-dealing kid is basically supporting his crazy mom and his deadbeat dad. And at some point in this, we see the guy from the beginning sort of show up. And we realize that, oh, this is the trickster, this is the raven. Because hmm. he turns into the raven, at least that's what we're led to believe. Although the kid also says, oh, am I going crazy like my mom did? So that's an interesting aspect of this story where we don't know, is this reality or is this this kid's mental illness surfacing? Obviously, it's a CW show. It's called The Trickster. Most likely there's going to be a mystical explanation for the madness. But, you know, if you if you want to just watch it as, as – if you want to be a person who wants to be open for any story – it makes for a good story because you do say, "Oh man, maybe he is all crazy." And as we, as all of us who who love to plumb the depths of uh, internet lore, we know they were crazy the whole time. It is actually one of the most popular urban legends on the internet. So it makes for a fun show to watch and to see what we can do. Um, but yeah, I like it. Like I said, I like that it's a Canadian import because. Mm-hmm. 
you know, this is the advantage of COVID is, I mean, as there are advantages is that, yeah, you know, we need IP, we need intellectual properties and they can't, it's not like they can say, oh, this was a hit show in Canada. Let's make an American version and said, oh, well, just import the Canadian version. So for once, the U.S. is like a season behind the Canadians on a series. So <clears throat> this could be the forever night of um, no. CW shows. You know, it's got a great team cast, you know, which is what you want on a CW show. I think it's the kind of show Little of Hellfire would like. So, you know, she likes Supernatural. They said, hey, if you like Supernatural, you'll love Trickster. So maybe if she wants to see, you know, young men of uh, North uh, Western uh, Native descent, this is this is for you. Um, it's kind of cool because he's got like uh, our protagonist has like a really fat best friend, hmm. and it, it's kind of interesting because his friend is like because his friend is a gamer and he's like yeah you know I got my account because there's this whole thing because his mom owes this guy owes this drug dealer money. And they have to, and he's trying to figure out how he's going to get the money before this drug dealer kills her. And then we find out that actually the mom actually solved her own problem without him, which is also a delightful turn of events. The kid, the fat kid sells his, in, in a little gift of the Magi turn, he sells his, um, he sells his account because he has this gaming account that is, you know, has all these rare and special weapons. Mm-hmm. And, um, exactly, exactly, exactly. So he has all these exclusive weapons and, and things in his account. He sells that, gets his friend the money, and then his mom didn't even need the money. They actually, <laughs> the mom actually talked the drug dealer into doing insurance fraud and then slept with him, and then. <laughs> Solved her own problems, because, you know, it ain't about you, superhero. It ain't about you. So, I really liked that in the first episode. I'm looking forward to the next few episodes of Trickster. I may start live-tweeting Trickster. We have to see. Because it's a 9 o'clock show, which is a perfect time for live-tweeting, except when you fall asleep. So, Uh it's like the best time for live-tweeting is 8. That's the best live-tweeting time, because I'm not drunk enough to pass out. But I'm also not fighting with everyone else for the TV if I ate. So, um, <laughs> but in this moment, it, it, it's a pretty good show. I do like it. I do like it. Um, is there anything you're watching right now that's interesting, you Philip? Is there some show you'd like to pitch and say, "Hey, here's the deep dive on my show"? Um, I'm trying to think what's new. Um, well, I mean, we just discussed One Division on Capes and Lunatics, and you and Maz are going to be. There's nothing more to say about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, again, we don't have the whole story on that. Uh, yeah. There hasn't been a lot new. Like I know, like Wolf and I were saying, Batwoman, the second season starts this Sunday. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's going to be interesting. Um, we'll see. That actually got kind of a weird shout out in like, because um, you know, Glad does the ratings about um, uh, about you know LGBTQ uh, plus representation in the media. And, well, I get their point, which is that because there's fewer shows being produced, there's less main characters, and also a lot of shows that ha- or there, and this is sort of this thing, is that there's LGBTQ representation in the new um, season, uh, Call Me Cat has a very prominent uh, gay character, which I love, because he's a older dude, <laughs> He, he is not a tip, because usually, you know, a lot of, I mean, yes, he is sort of a clownish character because it's the guy who played Beverly Leslie on um, Will and Grace. Uh, but at the same time, I, I do feel that he shows that you can be an older gay gentleman, and that is actually okay. And I don't think that's an image we get enough of um, outside of British comedy, um, where there's a great... Uh, great uh, series with Ian Serene and McKellen, and I'm blanking on the name of it right now, but I watched every episode, and it's brilliant. And since uh, Call Me Cat is a re- is a Americanized version of a British import, it makes perfect sense to me. So, I like that. So, I get the, like I said, I, I get the feeling uh, Call Me Cat has a bunch of these great 
BBC shows that kind of got mushed together from uh, Fleabag and Miranda, and maybe a little bit of um, uh, Serena McCone's show, which, oh, why can't, I think it was called Vicious. I think it was called Vicious, Um, because it was about catty actors, so, you know, but it was delightful, you'd love it, and (laughs) moving on from there, um, what was I saying, I don't know, but um, moving on from there, uh, there is news right now, which is that apparently the rumors of Charlie Cox in Spider-Man aren't overly exaggerated and are now done, I don't know. I know, but it's like, it doesn't that seem weird that they're like, oh yeah, he just wrapped filming on Spider-Man 3, and it's like, wouldn't we have heard about this before it, he finished everything? Not necessarily. Hmm. Especially, and this is the thing, they make the point that he's playing Matt Murdock. He may never actually be Daredevil in the series. Ah, uh, he might just be a lawyer. Yeah. So if they just did courtroom scenes, and it's just Charlie Cox showing up to set in a suit, that's not that's not going to get as, as easily leaked. Well, maybe. And so that could be a very interesting thing if we get the entire Daredevil legal crew. Maybe even a reference to another legal drama coming up, uh, She-Hulk, which is also rumored to have... Um, Jessica Jones? Jessica Jones. I'm trying to remember the actress's name. Who? I want to say it's the actress who plays Jessica Jones. Kristen Ritter. Christian Ritter, yeah. I get Christian Ritter and Kat Dennings mixed up, and I know they're not the same people because they are clearly not the same people. But the Ks, they get filed under K. Mm. You know how my brain works. And so I'm like, it's not Kat Dennings. No, don't tell me it's Kat Dennings. I know it's not Kat Dennings. It's Christian Ritter. So, yes, Christian Ritter is rumored to be in the new She-Hulk story, which makes me wonder, will we see She-Hulk in this too? Hmm. Will we see some Jennifer Walters in this? Will there be these other things? Maybe not even Jennifer Walters, but like a reference to, oh, yeah, you know, you probably want to talk to Walters. She's the one who handles this kind of stuff. It's like, you know, look, I don't have enough money for Walters. Can you help me out, Mr. Murdoch? I understand you help people in these situations. Or, like your theory, maybe we get a Jennifer Walters, but no She-Hulk. Well, that's the idea. Well, that's what I've always said. It was like, you know... Jennifer Walters doesn't have to be She-Hulk yet. In fact, as I've always said, the best argument is that She-Hulk is what people call her because she sued S.H.I.E.L.D. or the U.S. military or someone after the Hulk wrecked Harlem. Basically saying, this isn't the Hulk's fault. This is the military's fault for bringing the Hulk to Harlem. That S.H.I.E.L.D. and the military took actions that were detrimental to Harlem, and they are the ones to blame. So, um, also I like the idea of um, uh, uh, of uh, Jennifer Walters doing, you know, um, either pro bono, but also just like injury law stuff. So, it's pretty good that it would be a tort law, that she would be a tort lawyer more than the criminal law that most people think about, you know, when it comes to these things. Because when you think about it, like, really, Matt Murdock mostly handles torts. Mm -hmm. He has very little criminal law. His, like, one bit of criminal law was that we see is pretty much um, the Punisher case. But aside from that, everything else he's handling is actually all torts. So, you know, I'm just saying, I I think a lot of the cases that someone like She-Hulk or Matt Murdock handles are going to be torts. They're going to be like, oh, hey, you know, the actions of this person cause injury, give us money. And so that's the thing. So that would be very, it would be very interesting if we see Matt Murdock in Spider-Man, if there is a backdoor for, um, for She-Hulk in that as well. And that would be a very interesting idea that they're going to have all of the defend, all the Netflix stuff show up in Spider-Man properties, mm. you know, cause it's like, yeah, you know, we want to keep some separation, but tell you what, let's put all the Netflix guys over there. And we're going to just slowly move them into the regular regular MCU. So that would make sense. Um, but I would love to see Kristen Ritter in um, She-Hulk. And actually, here's my big prediction. Big prediction for She-Hulk. Do you know why Kristen Ritter is in She-Hulk? Why? 
because she's trying to get Patsy out of the raft. Oh, nice. So she goes and says, hey, Jan- Ms. Ms. Walters, um, I was given your name because I heard you once sued the government over Hulk stuff. She's like, yeah, I did that. Um, <laughs> my friend Patsy shouldn't be in jail. You know, my friend Patsy needs to be released. And they're, she's being held under criminal activity, you know, uh, uh, under cruel and unusual situations. This, of course, will eventually lead to our Thunderbolt series, where we are going to see that, you know, Zemo is going to form his thund- Thunderbolts with other people at the raft. Because it doesn't matter if you have superpowers or not. You fought superheroes. We're going to call you a supervillain. We're putting you in the raft. And this is what we're building. And maybe that's how we're going to introduce Norman Osborn, too. Ooh. Maybe that's where we first see Norman Osborn, is he's a political appoint- appointee to run the raft. All right. Well, I looked this up. It was after you said Kat Denning's name. Do you know you know who were, what uh, cast list she's on? Which cast? WandaVision. She is, really? Kat De- well, listen to this. Kat Denning's Randall Park is also on there. Really? And James Spader is the voice of Ultron, it says. Yes. Well, I do know Randall Park was in there. He's yeah. playing Jimmy Woo. Yeah, yeah. So, so he getting, is, that, getting, that's part of it. We're getting Jimmy Woo. We're getting, uh, yeah, Darcy. Yeah, or, I mean. Yeah, well, um, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Kat Dennings. Yes, Kat Dennings is yeah. going to be in. Yeah. Which, again, goes to that idea that she is, she's a connective tissue character. Mm-hmm. And she's not freaking um, Natalie Portman, who's going to be freaking, Four. she's Natalie Portman's assistant, so. Although maybe we're actually going to find out that no, actually she was always a genius. She was just always standing next to Natalie Portman. You know, it's sort of the it's the Ben Grimm effect, like I said. It's like you can be a genius, but if you're always standing next to Reed Richards, everyone thinks you're dumb. And if you don't really feel obliged to dissuade them of their idea that you're dumb, people are going to think you're dumb. But it's okay because you know how smart you are. Or she, you know, it wasn't. What was Jane like, an astrophysicist or something? Yeah, Darcy didn't didn't know about that, but she's like, a, maybe she's like some genius computer hacker or something. Well, she could be any, and actually, she could be a genius astrophysicist yeah, too. She could, just not Jane Foster level. That's true. Because Jane Foster had the doctorate; she was working towards her. She was the intern. You know, it's sort of like, and and to, to put it to you in that other way, it's sort of like you know how Jane Foster used to be a nurse. And you could minim- you could minimize her with that, or you could say, no, that's just the job she had at the time. And actually, she was every bit as much a great healer as Don Blake was. She just, you know, didn't have the chance yet. She had to get to that point where she could put herself in that position. Or, so, she, or and she used her nursing job to put herself through medical school or something. Exactly. There's lots of possibilities, Phil. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So get your head out of your um, chauvinistic mindset. Who, me? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. Uh, No, but yeah, so that would be neat. I mean, yes, I did know Kat Dennings was in there. And actually, again, I, I, you, you threw me on that loop again because it's like, really? Uh, Kristen Ritter's in it? I'm like, no, you said Kat Dennings, but that wasn't the word you said. But I, you know, I'm talking about one thing, you're going in another way, and it's like, wow. You know, yes, I did know Kat Dennings was in there. And uh, Park is in there. Yeah. I am interested in seeing if they're going to do deeper a deeper dive on Jimmy Woo. Because Jimmy Woo, of course, as the head of the Agents of Atlas, is an interesting little side aspect of his character. Or what if what if in the MCU, if it, if it is Sword, what if they're cherry picking people? They're p- picking Jimmy Woo. They're getting Darcy. They're getting Monica Rambo. Well, but the, here's what I was going to say: if they do decide to explore Jimmy Woo mm-hmm. as the head of Atlas or within his own group, you actually have a tie to that to the Mandarin, the Ten Wings, and Shang-Chi. So you actually create this entire, because that's all the same group. You know, that that's all this interaction of secret <laughs> secret superhero, secret supervillain societies that are actually trying to do good. Which, again, ties back into WandaVision and the idea that we're going to see both Strucker and Stark called out in the first two episodes. That 
you know, as Strucker says at the end of, um, which one was that? What, which one was that? Age of Ultron. What was that? Age of Ultron. No, it wasn't Age of Ultron. Um, oh no! Uh, what Strucker? Wait, Strucker. Strucker was at the end of something. Um, oh, it was at the end of Winter Soldier. Well, oh, at the end of Winter Soldier, Silver and Scarlet Witch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, "Oh, yes, you know, Shield and Hydra—they're just two sides of the same coin." Yeah. And the idea that you're going to start with Stark and then go to Strucker suggests that that same two sides of the same coin is still at play. Similar to something that, you know, um, similar to things that have been said throughout the Ages of S.H.I.E.L.D. series, the original Avengers film, about, like, the enemies of S.H.I.E.L.D. and then what is revealed in Winter Soldier about what the what the what the actual shield and its enemies are doing together there's a lot going on here i think that we're going to get a lot in wandavision i think we're going to get even more as it progresses on into captain america and bucky uh the series um of which by the way now chris evans is saying i'm not negotiating a return to the marvel universe why would you even suggest that that sounds stupid um I think he said this is news to me, but you know, you always, yeah. you always got to wonder if it, you know, if their people are dropping this, you know, for, because if he does want, well, if he does want to come back, it's like, oh, hey, look at all the interest we, uh, you know, on the internet this week. Oh, I think that honestly, I think they'd be happy to have him back. Oh, yeah. I, I think that it is, it's not for nothing. Robert Downey Jr.'s last episode, last movie was like six movies ago. Yeah, you know, it was like you know. He had to negotiate, and he said, okay, so what is it? So it's like Robert Downey Jr. coming back, uh, Chris Evans coming back. None of these things are impossible. No, I'm just wondering if it's like contract. You know, he got to negotiate a new contract, though. We have to negotiate a new contract, and you have to ask, well, what is it worth? So, for example, if we're going to do – so, for example, if we do Old Man Cap, Director of S.H.I.E.L.D., is that a mm. – um, h- how much does that cost? Do we want to de-age him? Are we planning on doing a Secret Empire story? What's the plan here? What are we building towards? Are we going to do some old school stuff? Are we going to do a William Burnside story? My favorite. Um, we were going <coughs> to tell Chris Evans, hey, Chris, you want to be a villain? And Chris would like, yes, I would very much like to be a villain. That sounds fun. Um, okay, well, you know, there's this villainous guy who looks just like you in the Marvel Universe. His name is William Burnside, and he was the Captain America in the 50s, and he's got some pretty messed up ideas about, you know, loyalty to the United States. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, these are possibilities. These are what make the this early stage of speculation fun. Uh uh, you want to talk uh, Thunderbolts, Phil? Yes, Thunderbolts number one. Thunderbolts with, among my many favorite characters, Batroc the Leaper. Yes. He's back. Batroc the Leaper is back. This is written by Matthew Rosenberg. You did a good job, Matt. You should be proud. Um, yep. I'm really surprised to see Star on this because I thought she was like one of these I'm a living Infinity Stone people. But, um... So this is her shtick. I don't know who this Ampere guy is, and I kind of feel like he was created for this episode. He might have been, yeah. I mean, I, um, you know, it, it's kind of weird. And then the I know Mister Fear isn't new to this, but it does seem like he's kind of just added in here. Like I, I think I don't know if they they maybe like read a couple things for him, but it just seems there's been a couple Mister Fears. So I mean, that could really be anybody, yeah. Yeah, one of my favorite things in this is when Rhino basically says, "Yeah, I'm leaving," and you know, you know, uh, you know, Taskmaster saying, "Fine, we got a job. No one leaves. We're sticking together." And then it says, "I'm leaving." It says, "Hey, sure, big guy. I didn't mean you. It's just what does he get to leave? It's because he's the Rhino, and I can't keep make him stay. All the all you other mooks I can make stay, which is delightful." Um, of course, Fist says they can't wear masks because no masks, which is fair enough. Fair enough. Um, we get a nice little Suicide Squad call out when we're the bad guys. Uh-huh. Uh, Fear steals the jewelry. 
Yeah, I know. It's yeah. Anyway, um, and they're basically fighting the. Um, they're basically fighting, you know, all of the Symbiotes. various things. I forget who they're. Oh, they're going to Ravencroft. That's right. So you need to get to Norman. Well, Norman Osborn. But we get a great scene because Batrock stays behind to fight the bad guys to save everybody. And then you think you're going to leave him behind. It's like, no. <laughs> I am I am the leaper. No. That is literally my name. I don't have a superpower, but I'm really good at jumping. And I lo- what I love about this is he does the... he Actually, no, he does do a tumble. Yeah, he does a tumble. I actually think that it would have been better had he actually done a, a leap like you do in ballet, where you extend the leg, because that's how you actually make sure you have the length to hit the ground and then move your ne- next leg over. But anyway, they, they did it the they, they did it the, the typical way that they, they usually do these things. But. I, I, I just love this when he, yeah, when he jumps on the boat and they're like, did the symbiotes touch you? He's like, no. He's like, no, Batroc does not get touched unless he desires it. Yes, which does make you think that he's probably got a symbiote like uh, on his butt and you just <laughs> you just don't know it. I mean, that is classic zombie. Yeah. Oh, no, I do not have the zombie bite. What do you mean? As you do have the one bit here, you see, we see the symbiote hand reaching out to him. It's getting shocked by electricity. So maybe not, but... How much how much symbiote you need to actually infect someone is always the question. Um, and they go to the Ravencroft Institute, and of course all the lights, which is, actually this is kind of weird, because clearly the lights are on in Ravencroft Institute. When they go to the doorway, it's like dark in the hallway, so I don't know what that's about, aside from dramatic effect. Yeah, um, because Norman. Yeah, Norman. Because Norman, that's what we can say. Uh... And shout out to Mike Hobson. Oh yes. Yeah, you know, all the greats all the greats leave us eventually. That is the sorrow. Uh you read Immortal Hulk? Yes, I did. This was interesting. Yes. Um I'm not sure how I feel about Samson taking over Sasquatch's body and then becoming green now. <laughs> oh, sorry, he'll die and go through his own door eventually. Yeah, eventually. I like Puck, and I definitely like Titania in this. Oh, I hate Guy Rich. Everyone I, hates Guy Rich. Guy say. Rich is there to be hated. Um, but we do get uh, the doctor back. Now she's with Chelsea, uh, with. McGee, and that apparently now McGee is a gamma mutate too. What? Because she was at the place where everything exploded, and we see that. See, this is this is the thing. This is the fourth wall breaky stuff that She Hulk does. This is where, when you're a gamma mutate, you can see other lo- la- layers of reality. Mm. That's something that's established. That is something that yeah, I guess is the idea behind all of this. Interesting is that a lot of these things she's seeing, they look a lot like the various mystical beings that were shown in I think it was a couple of Doctor Strangers ago. Oh. When he first meets um, uh, what, what's her name? Zelma? Yeah. And it's like, oh no, you see, you just don't realize these things are swimming around us all the time. But it's like bacteria. Some are benign and some are dangerous. So I thought that was a nice callback. It goes to that overall cosmology of the universe. Um, the leader's frustration about how he's trying to connect with the thing below all things, but in fact, as always, he weren't as smart as he thought he were. No, nope. yeah, cause he tried to he tried to absorb Brian Banner. He's like, no, there's someone else here with me first. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is the thing. But then, oh. This is the part you wanted to see. This is what we love. The ultimate. Oh, the end. Yes. The UFOs. Yep. The UFOs. The <laughs> folks who tried to recreate this. The um, Fantastic Force experiment. And it worked, sort of. 
that's what's weird about it. It's like it actually kind of worked, and they actually got all the superpowers. And for some reason, the UFOs actually tend to, generally speaking, have way more control of their powers than the Fantastic Four do. Because we've seen them all like revert to human forms on occasion. Even Iron was it Ironclad? Even he reversed? Ironclad, I think, has has reverted to human form in the past. You know, okay. we see Vapor do it all the time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and which is the weirdest with vapor because vapor is like whole thing is like oh no she can never be solid but then it's like oh no no she's solid <laughs> it's like nah you know she couldn't but then she could but maybe that's like you know your Sue Storm I'm invisible I don't have these powers well now I do and so I'm better you know yeah. but yeah I, I want to say that we, I've seen them all be humanoid in the past but you know, with Ironclad, I also think it's possibly, and same with X-ray, where it's like they enjoy being the monster more. You know, yeah. that's always a possibility, but, Phil. But now they're working for the government for Gyric. Well, they've worked for the government before. Yeah, they actually used to be. I believe they were the official super team for Maryland under uh, Hammer. Uh, yeah, on the Food State Initiative. Um. A Man Among Ye, this was a good book. Uh, I think I already talked about it on uh, Capes, but I really recommend pick up the four issues of A Man Among Ye. There may be a fifth issue. I don't know yet. But our writer said a tearful goodbye at the end of this fourth issue, and it kind of has a big heel turn at the end, which I thought is cool. And uh, it's it's a it's a pretty awesome crew of pirates. So I highly recommend Man Among Ye. For those folks at home, um, anything you want to talk about, Phil? Um, no, I don't think so. No, because we talked about Spider Man over on Capes, we talked about Gwenham over on Capes. So, yeah, I think this is a nice short episode. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed listening to it. If you didn't enjoy listening to it, have you thought that it might be because you have bad headphones? And if you just go to tweakedaudio.com, use the coupon code SOUTHGATE at checkout, you can get some really fine headphones at a discount. And then when you're done there, you can go over to huntedkiller.com, use that exact same coupon code, and get another discount on helping Michelle Gray solve a cold case, which would be fun. It's like having an escape room delivered to your house. It's it, it, it's awesome. Meanwhile, if none of that interests you, just go down to our show notes, click on the Amazon link, go to Amazon, and through the magic of cookies, everyone will know that you listened to our show and then went to Amazon and bought whatever the heck it is you wanted, because they got everything there, including Pod Life the Book, a book written by the Southgate Media Group family for you to both read in paper form or in digital form, and possibly someday audiobook form. So check that out. And in the meantime, Philip, if someone wanted to reach out to you and talk to you, how can they do that? Uh, if they want to get a hold of any of us, they can always email capesandlunatics at gmail.com or call the voicemail 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. And you can find links to all of our social media for all of our shows, links to our YouTube channel, our Patreon, our merch. Uh, all of it's at linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash capes and lunatics. Okay. And, of course, if you'd like to uh, write to me in that old-fashioned email way, the way our mods and pods ones did, do so at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on the Twitter. So, it's a live tweet, DuckTales, a woohoo. Maybe other shows like Possibly the Trickster. If I remember, at Charlie Esther, that's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-E-S-S-E-R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For what? For quality. Bing! Thank you, Maz. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for connecting with us once again this week. Why don't you come back next week and super connect with us once again. Good night. Good night. And anywhere you hear the show, Capes and Lunatics, or enough said, you will hear Charlie Esser and Mozman's Orb reviewing WandaVision episode by episode. We're going to try. You're going to try? We're going to try. We're going to try and review it. We may just talk about other stuff, you know. Wow. Use the job. It's a jumping off point. Oh, we, may, we may talk, you know, esoteric philosophy instead, as we do.